like to introduce Miles Kessler from the Integral Dojo. He's based in Tel Aviv, studied for many years in Japan, Buddhism as well as Aikido. Miles and I have worked together documenting some of the work and he's also putting together an electronic university so I invite you to check out his work as well as hope that you enjoy our time with him here. Miles, thanks for being with us. I was in Iwama practicing, you know, hardcore, really hardcore traditional Aikido and um, getting better, faster, stronger, but on that, 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 that wheel of duality, you know, that closed loop that you get better, faster, stronger and until you get weaker, slower and, you know, Older. worse. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. And uh, I, 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 was, I was at my peak in Iwama, you know, and I was, I, I left there when I was 34, I'd spent eight years there and... And, um, but I was, I was, I was getting that sense that, you know, this isn't really, I feel like I'm in a loop here. It's not exactly taking me where I want to be because emotionally I still felt, uh, not very masterful. And psychologically I was beginning to understand some of the, you know, the, the, the shit that made up my own psychological experience, but I was not masterful and skillful there as either. Certainly spiritually, I had a lot of spiritual intention, but it wasn't getting it. And that was a big motivator for me because where I wasn't getting it, where I wasn't masterful, where I didn't feel like I, I, um, I, I had the technical skill to work my way through things, I was suffering. You know, the basic existential stuff. You climb a ladder, you get to the top of the wall, and you realize, well, you know, what am I doing up here? This is, you know, where's the... My original in, intention that was, uh, you know, O Sensei, just seeing O Sensei in a book, yeah? opened a seed that, that had been that planted from whatever lifetimes before. And it was just like, you know, I was 14 and it took me what seven, eight years before I could actually get to a dojo and train full time, but I never turned back and that seed had opened, but it wasn't getting nourished. It kind of was with, you know, with, with all that kind of, you know, you can spend years developing, climbing that ladder that doesn't, that kind of ends at the top of a wall that that's not spiritual. And as I got there, I, I was realizing, you know, there's got to be something more. There's got to be something more. And the reason I mentioned Peter Ross is because I was, I'd come into contact, me and Patrick and Lewis and a few other people were passing around his book on effortless being, I believe. Effortless, power. effortless power. The, the yearning that, the seed that opened when I saw O-sensei was a spiritual longing. There was no doubt about it. It somehow came together with this, this martial arts fantasy that I had as a child, but there was no doubt about it in my mind that there was a spiritual longing. And Peter's book was the first one that was like, that, that could really kind of articulate those things together, even though I didn't understand. And he had a great saying, um, he often quotes uh, from Isai Chozenchi, Chozenchi, I think is his name. And he says that the, 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 the mark of a true master is that he can take from the dregs of the ancients and extract pure liquid or clear liquid or whatever it was. Just, you know, you take the shit and all of the, everything I learned in Iwama was the dregs of the ancients. It was the dregs, it was the leftovers. You know, it's that martial form that O-sensei kind of left for everybody. Saito-sensei uh, in, in a beautifully didactic way organized. And, you know, he, he also perfected the technical skill to quite a nice level. And he also had access to the principles for sure. But what was being taught there was the dregs. And I, you know, it takes a few years to learn the dregs and you get good at the dregs. And I just realized that, you know, the dregs only led me to the top of a wall and there was no clear wick liquid up there. And it was coming through to a certain extent, but there was something about that that was holding me back. And uh, that was always, that, that, was, that, that was always a, a true north, you know, my orientation. But it got confused with a lot of other cultural stuff and Japanese stuff and technical stuff and this school and that school and, you know, the story until um, the suffering of being kind of hitting my head, bumping my head on the ceiling of the wrong wall um, just kind of propelled me to, to actually do deeper practice. And, and that, to do that, I actually had to leave Aikido and go um, or follow my, uh, more of a, a spiritual path. And I did some of that with Peter Ralston. Towards the end of that, I just blew open and, and I was liberated uh, for weeks afterwards. And it was, you know, talking about you, you, the emotional freedom that I felt in just relating with people, uh, something I never really achieved in Aikido. And I knew that this was, the, this was the path that I was looking for. And, but I was clear, it was, it was when I was leaving Japan and I was clear that I didn't, 
that the next the next the next path on uh um on that kind of career path the iwama career path was to go back to your country and open a dojo and that's even what saito sensei told me go home and open a dojo go back to america and open a dojo but i just knew i couldn't i just knew i i that i had to find that that deeper uh spiritual essence wherever it was so uh anyway so I, I ended up going to burma for the next basically the next eight years i was dedicated to the spiritual path and i was still kind of teaching aikido uh in seminars doing tours around europe but i was really in burma and nepal doing a lot of deep meditation and for the longest time these were two parallel paths and they did not integrate they didn't come together you know i was either um practicing the spiritual practice or doing my aikido practicing my spiritual practice doing my aikido and it took some time before they started to actually weave together and then I started to kind of get this idea of what this pure liquid, this clear liquid that came out of the dregs of the ancients. And um, I have no doubt that, that what is beyond technique uh, is really the, the, the orientation, uh, sorry, the essence of the art. That, that's really what we're doing. Everything else is kind of, it's almost like this pen is, is the technical training or Iwama style, let's just say, and the world is Aikido. They're really that different. They're that, the, the scale is that much different. And yet most of us settle for this. We settle for what's here. You know, and that's ikkyo, nikkyo, sankyo. As you were saying before, you know, that we go, what was it? 10,001 nikkyos is going to lead us to the essence or to enlightenment or whatever it is. But you can't get there from here. It's, you're, you're, we're stuck here. So something has to happen. And that's the trickiest thing in the world. Either we get off the bicycle and we, we take it all apart, you know, we go do something else. And in my case, that's what I did. I stopped doing Aikido. I went and did a lot of meditation. I was doing half the year I was doing Aikido, half the year I was meditating. So I was off the bicycle. Or we somehow try to kind of deconstruct the bicycle when we're riding it, which I find is a very, very tricky thing. Because when you're deconstructing your Aikido, that means that you're going to start letting go of technical forms. You're going to start challenging or questioning the status quo of your dojo, challenging, questioning the status quo of your uh, uh, style, of maybe even your teacher, of the whole Aikido community, and the status quo is going to question you back. <laughs> and that's like, you've got to be one courageous mother to do that. You know, you've really got to be, that's the, the path of the spiritual warrior. As I said before, when I saw Osensei in a book, a seat opened, and I, I, many years later, 30 years, oh, actually it was about 40 years ago that I saw that, that I saw it. I'm only doing Aikido 30 years, but you know, it was many years before that I saw. What I realize now, what I was seeing, and I don't claim to be anywhere near Nero Sensei, but what I was seeing was my potential. You know, I saw him and I was reading the words. And I was just, I was just like blown away. It's like, oh my God, I want to move towards that. But what I was seeing was my very own potential in the future, meeting me in the present as a 14 year old boy. And it was like this calling that just, it drew me, it drew me, it drew me. And in, ever since uh, I was kind of moving towards my own potential and uh, Nisargadatta, no, not Nisargadatta, Ramana Maharshi says that uh, when you seek the grace of God, you can rest assured that the grace of God is also seeking you. So we can say, wait a second, I wanna actually find this clear liquid. I wanna move beyond the form, beyond the technique, beyond the style. And when we do that, that the status quo is gonna bite back. It's really gonna come after us. So it takes a lot of courage. But we have to have faith because it's really like stepping out there on our, on our own. We have to have faith that what is beyond, the thing that we are seeking is simultaneously also seeking us. As we move towards our potential, this kind of metaphorical clear liquid, mastery or whatever you want to call it, enlightenment, awakening. As we move towards it, it is also moving towards us. That I have no doubt about now. And, and as we start to get hits there, you know, in Aikido, to be honest, and more in kind of, you know, when you align with the principles, certainly in Jiwaza, two people coming together, uh, we start to kind of get hits of it. In music, jazz, I know you're a musician. Uh, when we start to get this creative flow with another person, uh, it's an amazing affirmation that, yes, this is the right path. This is, this is actually, this is so much more valuable than doing another Ikkyo. And I love... EQ. I love the I, I love the technical side, and I love to perfect and tinker and try different styles. And I, I I love all that stuff. There is something 
fantastic, a magical, um, transcendent, I can't find the word for it, that Aikido has given me. Um, it's, helped me sure. it's helped me live in a completely different world than I would have lived in. And I have done my best to pass that on to people because that's where my value was, not particularly in the technical forms, much as like Christopher Lee just said, you know, I'm a martial arts geek. I love doing it. I love the, all learning all the stuff and rolling around on the mat and throwing people and all that. But there's been something magical. And uh, I'm hoping that between all of us, as Don Juan said, so people can begin to see reality in the crack between the, the worlds. Awesome. Awesome. What a great intention, man. It, what sustains me in that is that I'm held by that clear liquid. I think the, the, the greater potential of Aikido is this state of you know, true oneness. We have, to, we have to face conflict full on. It's one boundary and another boundary bumping into each other, having conflicting agendas and working it out. And the principles of Aikido are the only way i'm not saying that it has to be aikido but the, the principles which are in many things the principles are the only way that we can actually work out and deal with our conflicting agendas in in a way where we actually come together into a greater sense of unity and um to be honest i notice many times there's a certain preference to avoid conflict in the sense that no we're practicing the path of harmony we have to be love peace and harmony Aikido is an art of peace, which on one level, I think it's a cool translation. Another level, I think it's actually a mistake because I think peace is a byproduct of what we're doing. It's not the path of what we're doing. I think we're actually walking the path of conflict, meaning that when, when one boundary rubs up against another boundary, we work it out. We don't back off. And I think that Aikido actually is the next step where... Um, we come together with our differences, our boundaries bump, bump into each other and, you know, with our practice and with our skill and to a large part, you know, through the grace of God, we work it out and we, we come together in a higher harmony as a byproduct of the way that we face this conflict, this extraordinary part of this extraordinary listening that you always talk about. And it's, the, the beautiful thing there is that it doesn't equal 100%. It's not like you and I come together, we disagree, we work it out, and we come to a new harmony. It doesn't equal 100%. The sum of the parts do not equal the whole. The whole is 1,000%. That's the real resolution. We become, that's, what I, that's the gift of Aikido to the world. It's an explosion of a higher way of coming together that is multidimensional. It opens up in other, uh, 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 other ways of functioning in the world. Aikido was an expression of, of Osensei's perspective, of his awakening. And, you know, and we looked at it from the outside and say, well, that design is elegant, it's, it's intelligent, and it's life-affirming. Nothing there is, is breaking or damaging unless you do it wrong, unless you make a mistake, or unless you, you're a bad seed and you bring a wrong intention you know, into it. And then Osensei, you know, he did this thing, and, and he, he had this, this, this timeless awakening that, that you know, throughout millennia that mystics have been having, having, and he was able to somehow manifest that as Aikido. And yet it, when he had this awakening, it came through and he was still fully doing this martial art, but it was, it was life affirming, 100% life affirming to the point that people, it, you know, he, he said it himself in his dokas and his poems that the moment somebody even has the intention to attack me, they've lost because they're attacking. And he had, they're attacking themselves. And he had the perspective to see that there was no difference between him and others. And uh, somehow he was able to, to manifest that in, in, in fully facing people. And it was profoundly disarming. Even if they would do an attack, they wouldn't attack again because it, they just realized there was, no, there was nothing to fight there. It's like, you know, literally trying to punch the air. It's like, it's even worse than that. You're punching yourself. You end up hitting yourself. So it completely disarm you. So what is Aikido? <laughs> so the best answer that I can give, you know, I mean, Aikido is something to experience, yeah? And that's the beautiful thing. You know, uh, in Christianity, there's a saying, um, uh, I guess a saying from Jesus, that uh, when, two, when, when, two, when two of you come together in my name, I will be there. And uh, it's really beautiful. So when two people come together, really come together in the spirit of Aikido, where I think Aikido has its 
greatest gift to humanity in the field of conflict. When we actually come together with that spirit of Aikido, you know, we, we say whatever, we can call it whatever we want, but there's an intention to actually come together in a higher way. Um, when we really bring that in, it will appear. And that has a transformational effect on any, on any conflict. So, and I know I mean, this is what you do in your work. I've seen you do it live and, you know, and I've done it with you, you know, not just on the internet, but on the mat. But it's, it's just an amazing thing. When two of us come together in, in, in my name, I will be there. What I came to understand was, was, was a authentic spiritual practice. And I mean that, I, I say that in the sense that the practice, that the techniques that I was doing, the methodologies that I was practicing would lead you to an authentic spiritual realization. Whereas the techniques have that potential, but it's not, it's rarely being practiced that way. And it's, a, and it's actually a lot of, it's a big kind of roundabout way to get to it. As you start to deal with your fear of being thrown hard or confronting someone or whatever, and more and more you become a less frightened person. Right. Courage, your heart starts to show through that, that when all of us show our hearts to each other, when we are able to be true and authentic beings with each other, that Aikido will bear fruit in the world. The devil might yeah. be down to defeat and Aikido, will, the spirit will rise up in victory and Aikido will bear fruit. So that's, that's what I think we're, we're working on. And I think in our conversation now, this one in particular for other people, is to help other people see a path, explore it. Like I said, I don't care if they go through the door. I'd like them to know that there is an option, that there are some possibilities. And these aren't even in any way the possibilities. They're just possibly some of the possible possibilities. Uh, let people explore much more of what the art offers because they put in so much time and so many sorties and so much energy. Right and on, yeah. clearly there. But I feel a lot of them are getting, like I say, a 2% return on their investment when they could be at 2,000%. Exactly. So right. you could condense the essence of that into a pill to give to the other people. How do you get there? Okay, so I'll, I'll try to reduce it to as few words as possible so I can get essential. But, but Aikido is a, path, it, it is a higher path of, of spiritual development. You know? And the first step on any path of spiritual development is the first path, the first step on, on the path of Aikido as a higher spiritual development is, is a step of, of self-awareness. And that's simply getting, bringing your attention in, feeling the body, feeling the breath, feeling the center, feeling the senses, paying attention to what's going on in the mind. Centering yourself in your own awareness is the first step. And it's the foundation practice of all further evolutionary practices in Aikido. So that's the first thing that has to happen. And while we're doing that, we learn how to integrate it through all this kind of technical training that we do. And we learn how to do it while we're in intense relationship with another person, which is almost impossible because it's the antithesis of our biological conditioning but that transmission is is really really important that's a that's a massive transmission you know and that's something that that you know we it's our duty to do the same the barrier between where they're at and where they can be is is so thin it's such a, it's such a right. the veil is like nothing and it just takes a little bit of that's my prayer. I just want to say, hey, Richard, it's great talking to you. Thanks for the invitation.